Hello, today we are with Mariana Everson, who's a candidate for state representative in Legislative District 19. Thank you for joining us today, Mariana. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. So. Yes, please uh, come, uh, go ahead, uh, give us uh, a little information about yourself. All right, um, I'm a, a, a nurse and a mom here in Grace Harbor County. Um, I have been work active in my community as a community organizer and have been serving the people of this district um, in my work as well. I serve the people of LD19 as a registered nurse in the mental health um, care industry. I care for people in mental health crisis um, when they are a danger to themselves, danger to others, or gravely disabled. Uh, help them find their way to recovery and um, we also help them find their way into um, the world um, with housing and um, outpatient services and all, all the stuff. Uh, I think that this work has uh, been the calling of my life, but I have come to realize that I need to expand that calling to um, all the people of LD19 and all the struggles that we all have because um, uh, we're worth it. <laughs> we deserve to have a good life. And uh, so uh, I started lobbying my representatives in our district and a little bit out of the district and, you know, also our congressional representation and uh, kept getting no, no, I won't use my political capital on universal health care is one of the answers that I got. And so I kept, I kept looking for someone to run to challenge these people. And uh, we have a specifically uh, one Republican that represents us in our district. His name is Jim Walsh. And um, his ideas are um, outrageous and um, di divide us up every day. So I kept looking for someone to run against him. Let's get rid of this guy. This guy is hurting us, uh, you know. And uh, nobody was would do it. Oh, I can't afford it, or I have kids in college, or are you crazy? You know, all those things, and then it just came down to, well, I guess it's going to have to be me. So I decided to run against Jim Walsh. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for doing that and doing our community a service. We need more people to do those things. We really do. Um, I, I looked through your website and I noticed that you have a, a lot of talk about uh, taxation and how it can be uh, more fair for uh, your constituents, the people of LD19. Uh, um, uh, how do you think that we could make taxes more fair for Washingtonians? Yeah, so Washington has uh, the most regressive tax system in the country, meaning uh, I pay more in taxes to the state of Washington and the city of Montesino than uh, Jeff Bezos does as a percentage of my income, right? And so do you, and so does everybody that works for their wage. Um, because we have a sales tax is one of our primary ways that we collect taxes in our cities and counties and at the state level. Anytime you buy something that's not food, um, you're paying a tax and um, poor people and working class people like me, we spend all the money that we make. We don't put it in the, in the stock market or offshore or somewhere else for it to be safe from these kinds of taxes. And, you know, Jeff, he's a guy, he's like a human dude and he wears a certain number of pairs of pants, right? <laughs> How many pairs of pants could he possibly buy to make up for the, the amount of taxes that I'm paying and the little bit of tiny bit that he's paying as percent? So um, I believe that we need to uh, find ways to tax people who make more money than they need. Uh, this, it's uh, not right that uh, certain rich people uh, make uh, so much money and pay so little in taxes. And so um, <clears throat> I think we need to stop funding our state off the backs of the working class and poor and start, um, it, you know, it's like an opportunity, right? Like it's this untapped resource that we have in Washington, that there's this mass amount of money that we've never taxed. So we can start taxing it with a, 
however you want to tax it with a, 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 an income tax, which we'll have to fight for uh, because it's in our state constitution that we can only have the same amount of ta income tax for everyone. But we can do that right away. We could say anybody making less than a million dollars is exempt from the, from the income tax and everybody making more than a million dollars has to pay the same amount of income tax. So say 1%, 2%, 3% of their income to, to the state. We could do that right away. Uh, politicians are afraid to do this. Like they're literally afraid to tax the rich because they think that the rich will leave. Well, I say let them go. <laughs> if they're if it's that bad that they they don't mind paying that they they're gonna have a big problem paying their fair share. We're not gonna like, you know, take everything they own and make it socialism or something. Everybody gets the same amount. I'm saying they can afford it. They should pay. And there's a lot that would there's a lot that would that would would be fine with it. They would be willing to give. So let's do it. Right. I don't. They're a part of our community. They they uh, they have to go out and be on the street and see you know the the tent communities that are popping up. That's not good for them. Yeah. That's not good for no. their families. It's not good for their employees. And and you know they do the best they can to have as few employees as possible. But they do have employees that they have to pay for the health care and uh, you know it, it costs them if their employees are stressed and having to live in that society, it's going to cost them as well. Um, I think the false, the falseness that we have in our country right now is the idea of self-made millionaires, self-made billionaires, and now self-made trillionaires. Uh, nobody does anything by themselves. Like if you use a public road, if you use water at your house, those are, are things that our society has made that generations right. of Americans, you know, put their life's work into creating these things. They weren't, we didn't just wake up one day and they were manifested, they already existed. They, that was work that was done by Americans, you know, over decades and, and centuries. Um, and, and now they're using those systems to become insanely wealthy and then say, oh, I'm self-made. And that's, right. it's a lie. That's a it lie. It is a lie. Self-made in our country. Um, um, in any were, in country around the world. That's um, right. So uh, on to more like the corporate corruption, what kind of corporate corporate corruption have you seen in your district and then around the state? Sure. Well, um, the place I live, I call timber country because um, we supplied the boards that built the majority of the homes across America after the Great Depression, you know, had a big housing boom. We started building suburbs and all of that. And uh, those resources came from here at least mostly, um, millions of board feet of trees were cut down and made into, made into homes. So uh, those companies that own those forests, they got, uh, they have a massive tax break. They're Wall Street traded companies like Weyerhaeuser, Simpson, Georgia Pacific, and they uh, get a massive property tax break from the state of Washington. And the, the deal was so that they could, because they were supplying so many jobs, right? So many people had these good union wage jobs. My dad had one of those. Um, and uh, so that was kind of the deal. Like, okay, we'll give you this tax break because of all of these jobs. Well, those jobs are gone. Like there's a couple of warehouser mills in my district still, but they have a minimum of employees, you know, just like, uh, you know, they've automated most of it, right? There's not like hundreds and hundreds of people working there. Um, there's some small sawmills around that are doing okay. You know, they're, they're making, they're paying their employees a, a pretty good wage and, and benefits. So that's, that's really good. But it's not the massive amount of people that used to have jobs, you know, in this industry. So um, that's one way that uh, tax loopholes, tax breaks have been exploited so that the state doesn't get the revenue that it needs. But this Wall Street trade company, you know, gets to put it as a line item on their on their bill, right? They don't they don't have to pay these as much as taxes. Like you know, uh, I'm a tenant, but my landlord pays uh, his taxes on this property, right? And he gets that money from me, you know. <laughs> And he pays a certain amount of property tax and he pays a higher rate than Weyerhaeuser does or Simpson or Georgia Pacific. And um, that's 
that's just not right. And another way that corporations take advantage of us is my son used to work at Walmart. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure our audience knows how Walmart works. So they pay the bare minimum. They offer really crappy health insurance, <clears throat> if at all. And, and then they treat their workers like crap, like literally my grandson. Well, okay, this is a personal story. But my grandson was having seizures. And my son needed to have some time off to be with him while he was in the hospital. And Walmart fired him, let him go, because he needed that time off. It's just it's just you couldn't because he couldn't produce right he couldn't produce he wasn't useful to them so they uh let him go and so uh people at walmart are on food stamps and live in section 8 housing and you know get medicaid and all this stuff for their kids because they can't afford to live and walmart can afford to pay their workers just like safeway pays their workers or fred meyer pays their workers you know, they can be paid the same amount and, you know, and that's uh, due to Walmart being such a, a union buster, you know, they've, they've never allowed it into their companies. So yeah, those are a couple ways. Yeah. Yeah. That is so very true because now we have, we have corporations that are saying they can't pay people, you know, respectable wages. And I think that's even above what they're calling livable wages, because mm -hmm. you know, in our state now, we're 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 being told that we're so great because we have a fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage, right? Like that's right. the 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 work for fifteen, and like uh, you know, we're we're considered to be ahead of the rest of the country. But then you know, you know, I where in our state can you live on fifteen dollars an hour? Um, Nowhere, and especially in those kinds of jobs where they don't even have set schedules. Usually, if you're at a mm -hmm. minimum wage job, if you're at a fifteen dollar an hour job, you're not getting Monday through Friday nine to five. You're right. getting the shift that they're handing you, and then if if hours are you know if, if profits are down, they're going to reduce those hours. You know, right? And you, you know, don't know what you work from week to week. Right, you're getting a weekly you know? schedule, right? With an up, yeah. Based on what you don't even do. know. Yeah. Oh, could you come next uh, two weeks from now to a barbecue? Well, I don't know. I'll find out what my schedule is. You know, can't. And then how do you pay for childcare with that? Right. So you have a, you work at Walmart. Say you're even a even a, a dual income family. Right. How do you pay for for childcare when you have to be at work until 10 p.m. or or arrive at four in the morning or you know how do you even schedule that? You know, it's not even possible. The only thing that you can do is what I did when I was with my first husband. He worked from six to two, and I worked from four to midnight. We never saw each other, you know. Right. And we just traded off the kids. For what kind wage, of family life is that? Right. For a minimum wage job, or, or yeah, you know, a job that doesn't really respect you as a person. You know what I mean? Uh, That's right. It, it's you can really see when you look at at the situations we're putting people in why why there's so much disappointment in the system right now. Um, to change topics just a little bit, I've heard that uh, you are involved with Whole Washington. Um, would you please share, uh, share your story about Whole Washington and why you're involved? Sure. Thanks for ask, asking that question that way, because that makes me think of the entire story. So in, uh, I think it was 2017, the county of Grace Harbor um, was lack for a health insurer for people on the on the exchange, right? Nobody wants to cover Grace Harbor County because we have horrible health outcomes. We, we have the most addicted people. We have the lowest life expectancy. Um, we, we're poor, we, you know, we're poor people out here. And uh, not everyone, of course, but it, it's it's not easy. So I went looking around as we were working at, I was working in a group called Democracy Rising that I helped found. It morphed into our revolution, in coastal Washington at some point, but we were Democracy Rising then. And we um, wanted to explore, well, what else could we do? Like if we couldn't get a, ins somebody to insure people here, what, what would the alternatives be and how do we get there to an alternative? So we, of course, being a bunch of Bernie Sanders supporters, we wanted to talk about universal healthcare, single payer, right? 
So we looked into that and we found a couple of groups in the state that we previously didn't know about um, that were talking about that, which was Healthcare for All Washington and Whole Washington. And representatives from both of those groups agreed to come to um, our empty mall, <laughs> where the mall gave us the center stage to set up some microphones and do a community discussion about what is universal health care, what is single payer, how could we do health care differently. So Georgia Davenport from whole Washington showed up and I really liked her and we got to talking about all kinds of stuff and um, I decided to get involved and stay, stay involved. I helped collect over a thousand signatures for the I-1600 when we were doing the People's Initiative. Um, and then I just stayed in contact as, they, as we made it into a bill for the state legislature, which is uh, Senate Bill 5222 right now. And I've been fighting ever since. So my next step for whole Washington is to get elected to the state legislature to in the house and become one of the sponsors of whole Washington's health trust and uh, get a not-for-profit healthcare system available to the people of Washington that covers everybody, everything. So I was like blown away when I read the bill. You can go to wholewashington.org and read it. It's just right there. The funding study's done. We don't have to wait for waivers from the federal government. We could do this right now, right now. Um, but I was blown away that like, you know, you think a, a medical, dental, vision, inpatient, outpatient, you know, all the stuff that's covered is like all these health benefits. And then, but then like you keep reading is like acupuncture, ambulance services, prescription drugs. It's all in one thing and there's no cost at the point of care. So you don't even have a copay or a deductible. You just pay, you know, your payroll tax or, you know, into it. And then your kids are covered, you're covered and uh, you don't pay anything when you go to the dentist. Can you imagine like going to the dentist and not paying $3,000 or whatever it is? That'd be so cool. It's amazing. And well, and it sounds like it's, it's looking at the holistic side of medicine that like we don't, right. you know, medicine isn't just for when you're sick, right? Or when you're dying. Like if you actually take care of yourself before right. that happens, it's actually a lot less expensive and a lot less taxing on on society, it also allows people to be more useful, to be more productive, right? If you if right. you these things off, you can be a productive individual for far longer, which, you know, I, I think the problem right now is, is we look at too many of these things as just the expenditure, just the cost, what's, what's the upfront right. cost, not in like, what's the cost if we don't do this, right? That's, that's right. That's, that's what right. people are forgetting to ask themselves is what is this costing us if we don't do it? Well, it's costing us lives, uh, my patients, I have had patients who died because they didn't want to leave their loved ones bankrupt when they when they go. Um, I've had patients die because they couldn't get the treatment that they needed. Like, I I know that I'm a little bit different than most people. I don't I don't know why, <laughs> but my heart is in this with my patient. Right? It's not like, oh, that's the customer. And I, I'm the I'm the worker, you know. There's no wall for me. It's they're they're now part of my consciousness, my world, and I remember just about everybody <laughs> that I've ever taken care of. If I see them again, I'm like, I know you. You have the mole on your, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, I care about them, like personally care about them. So I don't want them to die or go bankrupt because they need health care. Right. I think that, I mean, once I started thinking about that, like it took me a long time to even come to this conclusion. Right. I was just like everybody else, like generally voting, uh, kind of just surviving. Cause until I became a nurse, I, I was working those dead end jobs, you know, and I was just trying to survive. So once I started being able to have the moment to think about that, I was like, yeah, people shouldn't die because, they can't afford to live. I mean, that seems so morally wrong. Why have we accepted that in our society? It's so, not okay. So true. Um, sort of uh, playing off of that. Um, now, I know that I've seen like in, in Washington state early, you know, one of the first survivors or the first uh, uh, of COVID, you know, he had been in the hospital for 
an extended period of time and he got, came out with a bill over a million dollars that he didn't have to pay because it was, you know, because of the way that they had uh, set up the COVID relief. But you just think about that, like how many people, and, and he was an older gentleman in his 70s, mm -hmm. or how do you at that age justify that kind of debt to, for anything, right? So, so that person is now like an an indentured servant to the medical system if he had to pay that money. And yeah, and, and I mean, he was blessed enough to do it with the situation, but how many other people through our system are dealing with that every day where it's right. like, it's a choice of, do I become, you know, tethered to this debt for the rest of my life just to, to get this little bit better. Right. You know, and right. it, it, right. it's a very unproductive, I think, train of thought when you're having to think like that in, in, in a system. Um, but uh, going to more to COVID and 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 to to schools, uh, what what's your opinion on schools opening in the fall with with COVID still around? But, you know, I mean, as it looks now, it's going to be here, and and uh, hopefully we get more uh, treatments. But things like vaccines are, you know, at least a year out, in, you know, most likely, if not longer. Right, right, and that's just something. I mean, I'll just say a little bit about that about the timeline. Like, um, that's something that we. Uh, like the, I don't know who, the, the state, the media, the federal government, they haven't been up front with as much that this is going to last a while. You know, this is going to go on, especially in America now that we're not controlling it like we could have. Um, this is going to go on for a while. This is a year, this is two years. Uh, there's going to be people who, who pay for it the rest of their life and not financially, but like medically, like people who've had COVID, their bodies are changed you know, forever. Um, but uh, this is going to go on. And we're, we have to adapt and adjust just like with anything else. I mean, this is this is one of the biggest things in the last hundred years that we've had to deal with in this, this kind of way. Um, so uh, I'll just say my kids aren't going to school in the building um, this year. I have a senior, a junior, and a kindergartner that um, they're going to miss it. They're going to miss out. It's not, it's not any fun. Uh, but the cool thing about it for my teenagers is they're so digitally connected to their friends that they see and talk to them every day anyway over the, their phones or Discord or whatever, you know. Um, but uh, I don't think it's safe to send our kids into the schools the way they are now. So uh, one of the ideas that I've been reading about is decentralizing schools. You know, so uh, Montesano, little town, we have three schools. We have the, the two, two grade schools and then the junior, senior high building, right? And a, a lot of cities are bigger and I get it. But if we decentralize our schools, if we put those kids out into other spaces, churches, libraries, empty buildings, you know, the senior center, you know, different places and have fewer kids together, in one space, we could do it safer. And that would only be for things that have to happen at school. You know, like uh, we talked about like things that are hands-on, things that you have to have to touch the computers or use the lab or, you know, that sort of thing. And then kids can learn um, in other ways. Kids adapt, they, they're already uh, digitally uh, proficient, right? Like if I don't know how to use this, I just say, hey, will you show me? <laughs> how to make that work to my five-year-old you know <laughs> it's like they inherently know how to use this stuff so um yeah they can learn distantly and also i started thinking about i don't think i read anything about it i think i just kind of started thinking about it like what would life be like for them if they didn't go to school for one year what what would that change for them would they would would that hurt them would they be dumber? Would they lose things? Um, I mean, they, they were still smart and wonderful and beautiful and able to learn it, you know, in nine months or a year or whatever. They'll still be able to pick it back up and run with it and, and go, even if their learning uh, opportunities aren't the best for one year. It, it won't affect them in the great big scheme of things. So like, if you think of like the pandemic in 1918, 1919, I don't think there were many kids going to school or maybe there was challenges going to school during World War II, I bet you there was. And uh, prior to there being organized school, kids learned things, you know, and learned how to be good humans by uh, with their families or close 
close relatives. Uh, if you think of it, take the picture out bigger. Our kids are going to be okay, even if they don't go into a building to learn for one year. And, you know, they really are. They're going to be okay. The, th the problem is families need that as daycare, right? Families need that so that they can afford to go to work. And so that's where the problem lies. Uh, lack of, of technology, like lack of uh, broadband service, that hurts, you know, kids not being able to uh, learn distantly. They don't, they don't have a device or they don't have the internet to, to use it on. That, that would be uh, something that we can do as a state. We can provide broadband internet. We're doing it right now in Grace Harbor, like they did it, like the PUD, we live at Public Utility District um, all across the LD19. The PUD supplied Wi-Fi hotspots for kids to go and use their devices and, and do their homework and, you know, read what they needed to read. So we can do that all over the place. It doesn't have to be, um, ca you know, somebody doesn't have to make money off of it for it to happen. And that's something that I, that, that's like blows people's minds if I say that. Like it doesn't, people don't have to make a profit for this to, to happen. It can be a, a, a public good. It can be something that we do for each other. And even if somebody else doesn't make money off of it, you know what I mean? Um, I rambled on quite a long time there, but I, I just really think that my kids are going to be okay, even if they don't go to the building and they're going to be better off because they will be alive. And so will I, um, and my mother and your mother and your father and all, you know, they'll be alive and um, have the opportunity to grow and change and learn something from this situation, right? They're going to learn something just from being alive right now. Very true. Very true. There's a lot of lessons that are lear uh, learned through experience, not just, you know, from books. And, and, I, and, and I think too, it's a time to challenge. Like I'm, learning, you know, we, we're in the information age. Learning can happen anywhere. Uh, information right. is available all the time you know you were talking about asking your kid to help you with your phone um you know we live in an age where you can just ask google right you can just say right. his name into the ether if i say it now it'll talk back and then right. ask a question <laughs> right and right. it'll give you answers like and and so to think that education has to be tethered to one spot you know it, 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 I, right. we, we have to challenge it. And I think uh, we're starting to see it now with talk in colleges because they're starting to move to online and people are really upset about it and saying how it's going to be less than. And I just say, no, I think what you're really looking at is it's going to be better or as good. And potentially it just might undermine this huge cost that we have going. And it's, you know, I can see why they're scared about it. If, if people realize, wait, I don't need them to learn. And information matters whether or not they sign a certificate, right? I'm smart, right? Even if I don't have their their signature, right? That's but right, right. How does their signature make me a better person, right? So exactly, you know, exactly. That that's where the pushback's really happening. Is they're scared of us figuring out that information's free and we don't need them. You know? That's right. Uh, it is. It's right here. We carry the world's information right in our pocket exactly. there's a uh, harvard <laughs> university you can take harvard you'll watch harvard lectures on that phone and you don't need to pay yeah um, that's right so so in closing i'd like to give you an opportunity to just uh remind us about uh where you're at what you're running for uh give us your uh, uh donation info website info all that stuff all right so uh, I'll repeat my name. I'm Marianna Everson. I'm running for LD19 State Rep out down here in Southwest Washington. We call it Timber Country. Um, I grew up in this town uh, all through school and I uh, moved away for a little while, but now I'm here to stay. I've been back for 15 years or whatever. Anyway, so I'm here because I really care about this place. Uh, I love this place. I'm never leaving, and, and I couldn't stop loving it if I tried. Um, I want to see everybody um, have a thriving life, not just a surviving life. And I think that we can do that with uh, some really smart, progressive policies. And I'm willing to fight for those. I'm willing to fight for you. I uh, hope you'll go to my website, marianaforthepeople.com, which is M-A-R-I-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, the, the word for F-O-R-T-H-E-P-E-O-P-L-E.com. I have a donate link there. If you can afford to give us 5, 10, 20, 
bucks, that'd be great. Um, we're funding this completely by the people, not corporations. So uh, any little bit counts. Um, you can read my policy positions, my platform, and you can get involved in our campaign. And I really love to see more donations and more people volunteering because that's what we're doing to get this win in, in the books is uh, people power. Excellent, people power. <laughs> yes. Thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, good luck, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll see you uh, in November, and uh, you'll you'll be winning it and taking it home for all of us. Heck yeah, let's do this. <laughs> all right. Thank you.